Welcome to the Fallen Kingdom Review Part 2. After 9 days in development, hopefully it will have been worth the wait. Please let me know what you think after you have had a chance to watch. I can be reached at twitter.com slash permian sailback, and my favorite dinosaur is the Triceratops. Thanks, and have fun. That was a reference. It serves no real narrative purpose, many viewers won't understand it, and those who do might find it rather annoying. It's also very time consuming. Right, let's just get on with the video. After making it onto the boat, the trio sneak into the truck holding Blue. The vet says that she's losing blood rapidly because of the bullet wound and that they will need to do a blood transfusion. Apparently, Mr. Mercenary Man didn't provide her with any assistance and just assumed she could save the raptor without any help or equipment. We then get the first use of the word tetaneurin in a major motion picture, as the vet explains that they need the blood of one to give Blue a transfusion. Now, they have many options here. The most obvious would be to use Blue's closest relative, the Gallimimus, so of course they go straight for the Tyrannosaurus Rex. In one of the early teasers, we saw Claire open up the cage holding the Tyrannosaurus, and Chris Pratt saying, This is gonna be awesome. And I low-key got worried that we were gonna see a repeat of The Lost World, but with even more murder. But apparently they were actually just trying to save a life rather than end many. The next scene that follows is quite fun as we get to watch the two of them struggling to extract blood from a tranquilized Tyrannosaurus, where Claire ends up riding on its neck and Chris is squashed against the side of a cage. They then get locked in and the Rex wakes up, but Claire manages to climb out the top of the cage and Chris jumps through the jaws of the Tyrannosaurus to safety. It's a goofy scene, but it's the dumb stuff like this that's actually the highlight of the film. At the same time all of this is going on, we get introduced to Toby Jones's character, an auctioneer, yet another Englishman playing an American. Why did he even need to be American? Heck, why did Mills need to be American? Why did Lockwood have to be British? Oh well, Sam Neill was a New Zealander after all, so I guess it just runs in the franchise. Toby Jones is here to auction off the dinosaurs, which Mills predicts will go for about three or four million bucks, which is really lowballing it. Sue, a complete Tyrannosaurus skeleton, sold for eight million, and you're telling me that a live Tyrannosaurus would sell for half of that? Toby Jones is equally as unimpressed, so Mills shows him the lab in the basement of the house, with a lift accessed by the code 7337. So simple a child could remember it, which is exactly what Lockwood's precocious granddaughter Maisie does, following the men down to a basement and discovering that they have created a new hybrid named the Indoraptor. She also accesses a computer, and there's a sequence where she watches archival footage of Chris Pratt teaching Blue as a juvenile, which cuts between that and the protagonist giving Blue the blood transfusion and removing the bullet from her. In the archival footage, Chris Pratt goes all Nick Cutter and starts referring to her as a Cretaceous era theropod dinosaur rather than as a Velociraptor. But to be fair, if the JP Raptors were real, paleontologists would likely only be able to narrow them down as theropods with certain Manoraptor and like features and certain other features that are much more Pseudosuchian in nature. At long last, Dr. Wu appears as the only other returning Jurassic Park character. He berates Mills for allowing Blue to be shot and explains that he needs Blue to mother the next generation of Indoraptors. This is at least a somewhat logical explanation for wanting to capture her rather than needing her DNA because he lost the vial or some such nonsense like they had for the Indominus. Maisie then finds the Indoraptor in one of the enclosures in the basement. Unlike the Indominus, we only see the hand at first, which would be nice and suspenseful if we hadn't already seen a 3D rendering of the animal in the previous scene. Mills discovers her and locks her in her room, but she escapes with a reference to Jurassic Park 2 Revenge of the Raptors. She warns Lockwood about the auction and he confronts Mills about it. Mills promptly murders him with a pillow. The convo trucks on the boat move off to the mansion. The IT guy gets mistaken for staff and disappears for much of the rest of the movie, while Chris and Claire plan to ditch the convoy and warn the authorities. However, they are easily recognised and captured, and put in the holding cells with the dinosaurs. At the same time, we see the Tyrannosaurus transported into one of the cells using a really bad CGI goat as bait, which is really dumb given that the Rex didn't really have any other option of where to go and was being forced to go in one direction with cattle prods. Of course, it's only there to make another unnecessary Jurassic Park reference. Maisie sneaks back into Lockwood's room by climbing along a ledge from her balcony to his windowsill. Did I mention that she's hyper-precocious? She discovers that he's dead and takes the photo album that he was holding. She hides in a dumb waiter as Mills tells the housekeeper that she is no longer needed, which is a nice way of getting her out of all the carnage that is about to ensue. Maisie looks in the photo album and finds an old picture of her mother and the housekeeper, except her mother looks exactly like her. Now, I don't know why, but on seeing this I just thought, oh, her mother looks exactly like her. I guess they couldn't be bothered to photoshop the actress to look any different. If you've already figured out what's going on, well done. Most of my friends had twigged at this point, but somehow I didn't. I guess after seeing all the other laziness, like the wrong teeth in the Stegosaurus, I just assumed the prop department were on strike. 
Chris and Claire are confronted by Mills, who tells them that the auction and eventual weaponization of dinosaurs was an inevitability of their actions, of Claire's capitalistic ambitions on the creation of the Indominus, and of Chris's raptor training. When he leaves, Pratt realises that their cell is right next door to a juvenile Pachycephalosaurus. Oh, hold on a minute. What do you mean, Sticky Moloch? Wasn't Jack Horner the paleontological advisor on this one? Oh. It's a real shame, because next to the Carnotaurus, the Sticky Moloch is one of the nicest models. I don't even know why they changed it, given that the Pachycephalosaurus in the Lost World was roughly the same size. Chris Pratt whistles to attract the attention of the small dinosaur, and uses this to break them out of their cell. This is a rather entertaining scene, and makes for a good use of a Pachycephalosaur, which we haven't seen since the Lost World. Claire and Chris then find Maisie, who escaped Lockwood's room via the dumb waiter. They persuade her to come with them. Meanwhile, Toby Jones has begun to sell the dinosaurs. The first one on sale is an Ankylosaurus, which goes for 10 million bucks. Yeah, one of the last of its kind being sold for less than various cars, paintings and footballers. With this film's budget, you could buy 17 Ankylosaurs. Next up is an adolescent Allosaurus, which is nice because we didn't get a particularly good view of that one before. Chris, Claire and Maisie sneak into the back of the auction as Toby Jones reveals the Indoraptor, but only for a demonstration and not as something to be sold. We see that the Indoraptor has been trained to attack anything with a laser pointed at it. The bidders are so impressed that they begin to bid for the animal, and Mills decides to go ahead with it, which Wu objects to, pointing out that it's too dangerous. In the end, he sells for 43 million. That's comparable to an RAF Tornado aircraft, not exactly a huge investment for a potential weapon. Chris tells the others that they must stop the auction, so yet again enlists the Sticky Moloch to tear things up. Now, no one actually gets killed by the Sticky Moloch, at least not on screen, but it strikes me as a very high-risk strategy, because the way that that Ornithischian throws people around, let's just say there's going to be at least a couple of broken bones. Chris then goes in for some hand-to-hand -hand combat with some of the guards, which is actually the first of its kind in this franchise, if you exclude the various single punches and petty squabbles. The Sticky Moloch escapes into the forest while the room is cleared, leaving the Indoraptor in the cage alone. It's at this point that Mr. Mercenary Man reappears, asking for his bonus. He sees the Indoraptor and shoots two darts in it, knocking it out. He then unlocks the cage and wanders over to its head with a pair of pliers. Your dinosaur teeth will make a fine addition to my collection. The Indoraptor, of course, is faking his tranquilization, and no word of a lie, he literally smirks at the audience, before turning around and ripping off Mr. Mercenary Man's arm and then eating him. He then proceeds to leave the cage and swipes at the lift panel, opening the lift where Toby Jones is hiding. In fact, a lot of the things in this film occur because animals are just lumbering about and hitting buttons. Never mind a simple code that a child could copy, just using enough force seems to be enough to hack these systems. Toby Jones and the other bidders hiding in the lift are, of course, devoured. Claire, Chris and Maisie try to find a way out, but Mills confronts them yet again. He reveals that, big shocker, Maisie is actually the clone of Lockwood's daughter, rather than his granddaughter. Thing is, this was actually a big shock to me. I guess I just wasn't ready for human clones in a JP franchise. But here we are. And as we are here, I have to say I fully support their inclusion. In a universe where people clone dinosaur frog mutants from blood trapped in mosquitoes trapped in amber, a human clone is probably one of the most plausible parts of the entire franchise. Surely if the technology existed, someone somewhere would have had a crack at it. They did it in Primeval. The Indoraptor interrupts them by killing Mills' henchmen and the trio escape. At the same time, Wu has already decided to jump ship again, moving off with a bunch of eggs and DNA samples. Mills comes by and picks up the Indominus Rex bone, while Wu confronts the vet who refuses to let him take a blood sample from Blue. She then reveals that the blood is mixed up anyway after the transfusion from the T-Rex, but I'm not convinced that that would actually be much of a problem for DNA extraction, especially in a world where you can get dino DNA from a mosquito. However, Wu is knocked out by the geeky guy who was disguised as a lab assistant, and he's carried off by one of the guards for his eventual appearance in the third film. Some of the other heavies confront the pair, who let out the raptor. Blue doesn't explicitly kill either guy, but she does tear open a propane tank, causing the room to explode as she escapes at the last minute. Meanwhile, Claire, Chris and Maisie escape to the big museum room with a glass ceiling and a big pointy triceratops skull. I wonder what will happen. Well, initially, the Indoraptor just stalks them around the room. This sequence was actually very suspenseful, and it's what Bayona is best at, although it doesn't make much sense given the Indoraptor should probably be able to smell them. Then again, the Indoraptor does do the whole hybrid thing ten times better than the Indominus did. He's not just a T-Rex with big arms and superpowers. His behaviour is somewhat alien, hunkering down on all fours like a dog to track our heroes. There's also a nice callback to the original with the Indoraptor tapping its toe claw on the floor, which 
unlike the other references, feels like the reintroduction of a legitimately suspenseful behaviour. It's a shame that the design of the body still leaves a lot to be desired, particularly the impossibly shaped skull with no room for a brain. The trio manage to turn the lights off and sneak into the Mononychus diorama. Apparently, the dioramas are meant to represent some of the first animals that InGen cloned, which is kind of weird because Mononychus was discovered in 1993, and Concovenator and Dracorex were discovered in the 2000s. There's also a Dimetrodon, which is even weirder because there were no mosquitoes in the Permian. We also see a stuffed Dilophosaurus, which looks absolutely nothing like the one from Jurassic Park or the hologram from Jurassic World. However, the cute sidekicks find out that the propane tank that blew burst has reacted with ammonia via the Shawnigan process to produce hydrogen cyanide, which now threatens the dinosaurs in the holding pens. They reboot the system like in the first movie, which, like in the first movie, inconveniences the other characters and puts a child in danger. With the lights on, the Indoraptor finds them and bursts into the diorama, straight up sticking his claw through Claire's leg in a scene that actually made me wince. Maisie runs off, with the Indoraptor in pursuit, climbing into the dumbwaiter to reference Jurassic Park yet again, before escaping into her room and hiding in bed. Claire tells Pratt to leave her and go after the dinosaur, and of course they kiss. To be fair, I honestly feel like their relationship is a bit more natural in this one. I suppose it's because it actually feels like they're rubbing off on each other this time, rather than Chris not changing at all like he did in the previous film. The Indoraptor climbs into Maisie's room through the window, but is confronted by Chris carrying a gun. He shoots the hybrid multiple times to no avail, but at the last minute Blue arrives to help him out. She faces off against the Indoraptor as Maisie leads Chris along the ledges of the building to the glass roof over the museum where the big spiky triceratops skull is. The Indoraptor then appears to throw itself out of a window. It's the only explanation I can find for him falling backwards, because Blue certainly isn't strong enough to throw him. The Indoraptor confronts Chris and Maisie on the roof, but Claire arrives just in time with a laser pointer gun. Now, logically, she should point it away from the roof the others are on, and maybe to the nearest cage, but nope, she points it at Chris, using him as bait to trick the hybrid into falling through the roof, which doesn't work anyway. A frustrated Blue arrives to help save the day, as she did in the last film, but at least this time she does it without the help of Deus Rex Machina. She jumps on the Indoraptor, pushing them both through the roof and impaling him on the Triceratops horns. At least this time I was ahead of my friends, well, a few months ahead, because I called it as soon as I saw the set photos. Reunited, the trio joined Wildlife Aid and the IT crowd in the control room, where they discover that the system reboot didn't manage to get the ventilation to work to get rid of the hydrogen cyanide. Claire prepares to release the dinosaurs, but Chris warns her of the risks to all the people living nearby. She decides to leave them to die. So Maisie then sets them free. Yep, that's right. The little girl is the one that lets the dinosaurs out to kill countless people and animals, causing who knows what ecological damage. Well, I can't actually imagine this being all too much of a problem. There can't be more than a couple of each species, aside from perhaps the pteranodons that escaped on their own accord and the numerous comsognathi. You mean to tell me the US Army wouldn't be able to take them all out overnight? Anyway, Mills tries to escape with the Indominus phone, but finds a group of compies perched on his car like in the Lost World. We see a Carnotaurus sneaking up, but alas, it's the bloody T-Rex who gets to him first. First, although the Carno does help to tear him apart before being chased off. The Rex then does the pose from the first movie, but she bends her tail like she did in that film to fit in the museum, but in the open, in this film, it just looks really dumb. Also, the JP music plays, and it's really grating. Chris Pratt tries to convince Blue to come with him, but she straight up points at a cage, shakes her head, and wanders off in disgust. Jeff Goldblum appears yet again to warn us of the dangers which, as I previously addressed, probably wouldn't exist. We watch the dinosaurs that got sold be transported, ready to spread and conquer the planet. The Mosasaurus reappears, which begs the question of why it hadn't already since it had been out at the park for long enough for them to clone and grow the Indoraptor. We see that Chris Pratt and Claire have adopted Maisie, and that Blue is preparing to invade the suburbs and kill countless people. Then there's an end credit scene which we all waited for, which was like... 12 seconds of pteranodons on the Eiffel Tower in Las Vegas. Look, I respect you for breaking new ground and giving us an end credits scene in Fallen Kingdom, but couldn't it have been a bit more than just something that could have been before the credits? So that was Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, and what can I say except it's really odd. I'm not quite sure where I stand on it. Certainly coming out of the cinema, I felt that it was probably better than the other JP sequels, but why? I think I enjoy it the same way I enjoy many similar schlockbusters, like Pacific Rim or Kong Skull Island, which share many of the same strengths and weaknesses. The number one weakness of all of these movies is the utterly convoluted plot. As with Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom feels more like two movies in one, but unlike that film, the two plots don't fight for the same screen time. Rather, the first plays out, followed by the second. The first is certainly the weaker half, it's the sort of bombastic rubbish we've come to expect from the franchise. 
I have mixed feelings about its short length. On the one hand, I would have liked some more animal capture set pieces akin to Prehistoric Park, but on the other hand, when the volcano started exploding, I'm glad what followed was quite short. Apparently the movie was at one point an additional 45 minutes longer, and no doubt some of that would have been footage on the island, including a sequence with Dilophosaurus. This is the stuff I would really like to see, but as of yet there are no plans to release it because the Jurassic franchise is such a special snowflake. The second plot thread was really what the franchise needed, a whole new setting and a new concept. As I mentioned, the Indoraptor was a much better hybrid than the Indominus, and it almost makes me wish it was actually the first hybrid we got in the franchise, besides, well, basically all the dinosaurs because they're all frog mutants. The dinosaurs being heroes was also much less grating in this second act, as aside from Blue, they all felt like they were out for themselves. That's not to say the plot isn't a convoluted mess. So many things seem like convenience after convenience, from our protagonists needing to be on the island in the first place, to a truck being empty on the docks and no one checking it, to Mr. Mercenary Man opening the Indoraptor cage, to Blue pushing the Indoraptor through the roof. However, these things don't grate with me as much as they used to, because I can't say I expect a plot that makes any sense anymore. The characters are something I've seen criticised quite a bit, but I honestly don't get it. Chris Pratt is less of an asshole chauvinist in this one, and Claire is much more his equal. I actually felt like the two of them actually had some chemistry in this one, and their interactions were much more focused on either the dinosaurs or the situation than trying to make Chris Pratt look cool. Chris Pratt also does some of his best acting as a tranquilized man, and I found that scene quite hilarious. Maisie is a hyper-precocious child, but this doesn't grate with me so much as I expected, and I found her behaviour somewhat believable. Maybe having a younger brother who likes to climb helps. She doesn't kill a raptor with gymnastics, she doesn't survive on Dinosaur Murder Island for weeks, instead she just sneaks around and finds everything out, so the adults can deal with the problems. Zia the Vet was also a good character, if heavily underutilised, with most scenes either caring for Blue or handcuffed to something or other. Her totally platonic relationship with Franklin the IT guy was a pleasant surprise, although apparently in one of the cutscenes, she explains that she's a lesbian. On the one hand, it's a shame that they cut the reveal of the first LGBT character in the JP franchise. On the other hand, Trevorrow's horrific writing pretty much butchers the reveal in the most chauvinistic way possible. Here's hoping she appears in the next movie spouting more taxonomic terminology like tetanurin. Franklin was a very cliché character, and his screaming is the worst thing. However, he actually had something of a nice arc, going from a wimp who doesn't want to be there to the guy who actually knocks out Wu on his own accord. A lot of people have been saying that no one in this movie has any arcs, but along with Claire deciding not to save the dinosaurs and Chris becoming less of a jerk, I think there were ample character arcs, at least compared to the last movie, which had one really terrible character arc. Toby Jones hamming it up as the auctioneer bad guy was a joy to watch, if only for a short time, although I don't think I can say the same for the other bad guys. Mills basically screams villain from the first time we see him, and Mr. Mercenary Man doesn't have enough depth or good lines to make him a compelling hunter type like Muldoon or Tembo. Wu does very little. It's pretty clear they're trying to build him up as some sort of Thanos-tier villain for the third film, although B.D. Wong has said he is a more complex character, it certainly doesn't show in this movie. James Cromwell was also underused, but I'm glad he was actually one of the good guys. However, when it comes to underused, it would be remiss of me not to mention Jeff Goldblum, who was heavily featured in the marketing and then is in the film for less than two minutes. That said, I'm not all too sure what they could have done with him. Maybe if they bring back Sam Neill or Laura Dern in the next film, we could see some reoccurring cast actually do more, because at least their characters would have more practical application to the plot as people who actually know stuff about dinosaurs. The music is generally fine, I don't think it's quite as memorable as Jurassic World's, and certainly not the first two movies. I even started wincing every time the JP theme played, usually because it was accompanied by a really grating reference. The music is also one of the reasons this film falls below Pacific Rim and Skull Island in my rating system. When it comes down to it though, movies like Fallen Kingdom, Pacific Rim and Skull Island aren't enjoyable because of their plots, and while the actors are usually good and the characters watchable, the highlights of these sorts of movies are the special effects and the action set pieces. The special effects in Fallen Kingdom are much better than those in Jurassic World. The Indoraptor looks quite realistic, no doubt thanks to some of the lighting that Bayoni uses and the usage of practical effects. Blue has notable improvements in her design and doesn't look like the fat crayon drawing of the last film. Some of the others, like the Apatosaurus and the Gallimimus, also look better. The former is bulkier, the latter bigger, skinnier and less toothy. I've already spoken about the new dinosaurs, which were quite mixed, while the Stegosaurus takes pride of place as the most WTF dinosaur in the franchise. 
The action parts of this movie are so much more inventive and diverse compared to the other sequels, so much so that people compare this film to a Marvel flick. I honestly can't see how that's a bad thing, given that the worst Marvel movie is still better than the other three JP sequels. Examples in this film include Chris Pratt escaping from slow-moving lava, the underwater gyrosphere escape scene, the Tyrannosaurus blood transfusion scene, the Siggy Moloch rampage, and the suspenseful Indoraptor hunt, which is arguably the best raptor sequence since the kitchen scene in the first film. This scene in particular is really well shot, Bayona's cinematography in this is really nice, although unfortunately he's also responsible for the constant visual references like the laughable Brachiosaurus and the cringeworthy Tyrannosaurus. Bayona's presence in this film at all serves as a reminder that people still take this franchise seriously, as though any level of credibility this franchise once had wasn't instantly erased the moment a 12 year old killed a velociraptor using gymnastics. Going forward it will be interesting to see where they take this franchise. I can see it going two ways. Either they take advantage of the variety of settings offered by the concept of global domination by dinosaurs, or they completely screw things up and we go back to the same formulaic structure of the last three movies. This next movie is the most important sequel of all to world build, because for the first time ever it's actually a world. Please set up this new world order, set up the people who live in this world with dinosaurs, and set up the ecologies of these dinosaurs properly. Have Baryonyx living in Louisiana bayous, have Carnotaurus living out in open Texan ranch have Edmontosaurus or Pachyrhinosaurus or something living in boreal forests in Canada where it snows in winter. Give us some variety of settings, a variety of characters in those settings, preferably including more characters from the first movie, and can we finally have Dilophosaurus back? Thing is, I'm not sure whether to be hopeful for this next movie, but what I can say is, for the time being, having only watched it once, I enjoyed Fallen Kingdom more than the other JP sequels. It's not a great movie, not one I'd recommend to people who aren't into the franchise, but it's mostly harmless. 6 out of 10.